It's another episode of First and Knoll here as we get you set for the bye week. Florida State at four and three. Ario Masudi, Kurt Weiler, Roberto Aguayo. And uh, we thank you guys for listening. Those of you who have joined us week in and week out, we're on Apple, we're on Spotify, and of course on YouTube as well for your listening pleasure. The Knolls four and three now after a 34-28 loss to a top five Clemson Tigers team in Tallahassee over the weekend. With the bye week, uh, the fellas and I decided we're just going to do this one podcast, I think, middle of the week here, and then just kind of go through a little bit of that game. By now, you've already digested it. Uh, and then talk a little bit about you know where Florida State goes from here, give you some perspective on this four and three team and just what it's going to take to finish strong against a manageable schedule. So without further ado, uh, Kurt, we'll start with you. Florida state drops by six. It felt like Clemson really took hold of this game in the middle. Uh, so let's give me your macro perspective of what you saw from the tigers against FSU in that middle eight, as they call it, but also what you saw from FSU in the first quarter and a half and the fourth quarter too. I mean, Clemson was about what I what I thought they were. I think they're a good team. They're definitely better than they were last year. DJ has improved. I think that offensive line has improved. But they didn't blow me away. I think, I mean, I, for a team that was ranked fourth in the country, for the mass majority of that game, Florida State was uh, was right there with them. I mean, you talked about it. I think that game was lost in, in the, the middle eight. And, I mean, I think for the fact that Florida State, talent-wise, still doesn't entirely match up with Clemson, I mean – they were right there in that game for long stretches. They what led, they led 14, nothing. they led 14 or seven, nothing. They led 14, seven. And then they, they rallied late. And I don't care what anybody says. That was not Clemson letting off the gas or, or anything like that. That was, I mean, it was, Dabo was pretty unhappy afterwards talking about how his defense kind of let them back in the game. And I mean, they were an onside away from, from that one getting pretty wild there at the end, but uh, yeah, it, it is simultaneously uh encouraging and obviously discouraging just to lose a, a, a third straight game if you're Florida State, but I think there there are plenty of of positives you can take away from it. Roberto, I guess uh, from your perch in the Champions Club, you were able to, to kind of get a good view of a couple of those quarters as well, but FSU started off hot and it seemed like a good game plan coming in. They got Jordan Travis's legs moving um, on that first drive, uh, what was your perspective about the way the Seminoles started on this one? We started off strong. I mean, I think that was that was what we needed. Um, and w- heading into this um, top five matchup uh, with number four Clemson, it's it's it. I mean, everyone was hyped from the beginning, um, but it was we knew you know we we didn't match up well. It was going to be a tough sh- uh, showdown, and I think. S- Ultimately, you know, Clemson just had, you know, made, made the right play. I mean, it was a mix of a lot of things, but just ultimately, you know, Clemson's a number four team. They, they ended up holding strong, but we showed effort in the fourth quarter. Um, like I said, these, you know, we talked about the last three games, like, you know, a couple bounces. It could have changed a lot of things. We, we, we weren't a bad team. We put up a fight. Um, but from them, from when it started, it looked like we were going to, going to really contend and um, it just didn't turn out that way. Unfortunately. No, I mean, Kurt, look, man, like that Florida state on the stat sheet, and I know stats don't always tell the story, but in this one, I feel like it tells somewhat of what the growth of this program is. If you had told me coming in, the Knowles would run for over 200 yards against that Clemson defense. I'd have probably laughed at you. They did that. If you had told me they'd get 6.1 yards per play, 460 total yards, I don't think I'd have believed you either. So there was some good from this, especially early. It felt like the Knowles were able to really find some push up front in the run game and take it to a Clemson defense that I do think, at least in that front seven, especially on that D-line, has multiple NFL guys. Oh, for sure. I mean, I think it wasn't at a consistent enough level, and that's kind of what it comes down to at the end of the day. Because you look at it, I mean, Clemson had had seven tackles for loss on run plays, two sacks, nine total tackles for loss. So seven times of, of FSU's what? 32 carries, it was a, a negative play. And obviously those are killers. But that also, I mean, you remove those or you factor in that seven of them were negative plays, and that means you carried the ball about 25 times for a good bit over 200 yards. And so, I mean, it's a – yeah, it's a credit to, I mean, that's been a, a standard of Mike Norvell's throughout his tenure, throughout uh, 
it is creative creativity with the run calls, but that wouldn't mean anything. Like you said, if the offensive line didn't uh, hold its own, I mean, Clemson's uh, Clemson, some Clemson coaches and players, I think early this week in interviews after the game, talk a little about, you know, I mean, Florida state wanted it more. And, and I, I think NC state, I mean, you can look at why they were able to run the ball better against Clemson. Than they did NC state. I think a lot of that is NC state stacked the box. Clemson didn't as much, but the truth is, I think Clemson thought they would be able to stop the run with four for the kind of the four down linemen, because that's what they've done really at Florida State for quite a few years. And they couldn't. They tried that and they got burned quite a few times. And so, I mean, it speaks to the growth. It speaks to, I think, the the strides in the offensive line, even though they're without. I mean, a few guys we thought could or would be starters. And uh, it speaks to, I mean, we should mention, I mean, without Trayshawn Ward, that it was it was the. The Trey Benson, Lawrence Toa Philly show. And both of them, I thought, had some really nice moments. They did. And I thought they played hard. I thought both guys ran hard. Jordan gave you, I think, what he could um, and and looked dynamic, especially early in the game. And uh, you look at 28 first downs for Florida State, pretty good on third down, 7 of 13. And then, you know, only three penalties, which was something I think all three of us said would, they would have to limit against Clemson. And it really was that middle portion of the game. Really, as soon as Jordan Travis fumbled uh, down 17-14 and Clemson turned that into a touchdown, went up 10. And then they come out of the third quarter. Shipley hits the big return uh, right out of the gate. And then they capitalize with another touchdown. That's really where the game was put on ice, was 31-14, but it wasn't garbage time. This team, I thought, fought. Um, They showed you that they have that willingness. The culture's in a good spot. The program believes in Mike Norvell. The kids buy in. And, you know, I think in years past, this team might have gone down if they were up, you know, down 31-14, might have ultimately fell, you know, 50-something to 20-something, something like that. And so kudos to the guys uh, I know we keep talking about this, Berto, and we keep talking about tangible things and, and what I like to call soft factors, things that don't show up on the stat sheet necessarily, but this team does keep fighting. How do you, if you're in that locker room as a coach, how do you try and keep the optimism high and, and use this result as a positive if you can? Yeah, the tangibles, the things that you know aren't on a, uh, on a stat sheet uh that you get from a game like this or or a season like this is that the guys are buying it. Uh, Even Dabo Sweeney said it after, after the game in a press conference, he said the the way that those guys didn't quit during the, they could have quit early on in the third quarter. Right. Uh, Like, like we've seen a couple years past Um, they didn't, they fought to the last minute. And I mean, he even, he even, you know, press the the FSU fan base and said all the fans left, um, you know, late in the third quarter. And it's, and for them to, to, as a player, when you see fans leaving, it's kind of just like a little bit demoralizing where you're just like, come on guys. Like, you know, all uh, you hear all this FSU, uh, you know, fan base, like, Oh, we need to win. We need to do this. We need to do that. And like, it's like, you can't hang in to, to watch a full game. Um, it's kind of like, what are we doing here? But they, they, they fought, they kept in it. They didn't, they didn't carry it. But at the end of the day, that's what coach Fisher used to say. It doesn't matter who's watching the 4 million, whatever viewers who are watching on TV, the fan base, like all we have is each other on the field, the coaching staff, the guys, whether there's one person in the stadium or it's jam packed, like it doesn't matter. We're going to fight to the last minute. And That's what they did. And even Coach Sweeney said it. That shows you a a team that's buying in. A a culture is a winning culture. And for a coach, that's what you want to see. And that's what you tell the guys, like, hey, man, like, we're close. Like, like, without you guys doing this and without us having a a season like this, despite, you know, having three losses, like, we're moving in the right direction. It's not just going to come back like this and all of a sudden, like, yeah, there was high hopes, you know, before this three-game stretch where, like, oh, you know, we could win you know, all three, but really like realistically, like it was going to be tough. And just from learning experience, you know, for these guys, I'd be like, keep it up, keep buying in because good things will happen when you buy in, you know, give it your all. And, and everyone's giving it their all, not just certain, you know, certain players, everyone was giving it all. They fought and you're going to lose sometimes it's, it's a sport. Someone's going to win. Someone's going to lose, but I'd rather lose with every guy dying on the field, like giving their, you know, blood, sweat and tears. And that's what we saw. So technically, like, I don't see these last three games as a loss, especially this one. 
we fought to the last minute and that just shows effort. And then that isn't on a stat sheet. Right. So the, the intangibles, like, I think we're still headed in the, in the right direction and, and I'm excited for, for the last half of the season. Truthfully, I, if you're asking me, I think the only one of the last three that really got away was the NC state game. I, agree. Yeah. I think you look at the other two and I mean, it's funny that the road game was the one you probably should have won, but yeah, I think, I think, you look at the other two, and those are both, I think, really good teams. Probably, quite possibly, I mean, we'll see about Syracuse, the best two teams in the Atlantic. And you were right there with them. And, I mean, you haven't been in, in years past. And I understand the people saying, and don't be wrong, I agree. The the just a team that fights is is good, but it's also we're reaching the point for under in Norvell's tenure where it's kind of a bare minimum. That being said, for the people who are like, that's not enough anymore, so you would rather – them not fight. And I mean, that game could have got ugly. I thought that game was going to get ugly when it was 34, 14 or 31, 14. And they faked the punt and didn't convert it in the third quarter. I thought, Oh, well, this might get really ugly because Dabo is definitely still, I feels like wants to make a statement every time he plays Florida state. Maybe that's the 23rd, what y'all did to him. I think y'all hurt him a little bit for life in 2013 I think that's a little bit uh, the 2020 situation there with with Norvell. It's a mix. I think that's also just Dabo understands that Florida State's probably the biggest long term threat in the Atlantic Division. I guess the Atlantic Division's going away, but maybe in the ACC as a whole. But he he would have kept scoring if if they could. I mean they 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 were definitely not by any means like playing backups or or playing conservatively to anything like that. And and I think they wouldn't have minded that getting out of hand. I think that is something he could use recruiting wise and, and it didn't happen. Yeah, I agree with you a hundred percent. And you know, the last touchdown Florida state scored, by the way, Clemson blitzed. So um, yeah, they, they sent numbers. Oh, the the, play, yep. They're right. And, and Jordan six. evaded, evaded the pressure, did well. It was a great scramble play where receiver and quarterback were on the same page. And, you know, Kentron did a great job of, of helping his QB out and then going and making a big time play. So um, I don't, Kurt, I just, I, I, I am with you in that Clemson was going, was going for the kill shot. I do think is it's still sobering, right? That Clemson in that middle portion of the game, I, I think they kind of handed you perspective and reality of, yeah, we you know Roberto just touched on the intangibles of the game, but from this this, this game is not about just intangibles. You got to have dudes. You got to have guys that can change a game. And, and FSU still is maybe an off season or two away from truly being able to change the game. So, yeah, Kurt, I, I think back to you on this. It's it, it was a moment there of okay, okay. So this is where we really are in terms of wanting to get back to what this program's goals are. Robert Scott at, at less than hundred percent, which I think he played at Saturday and who knows, maybe come out of the bye week. He'll be in a better spot there. Robert Scott's still your best option at left tackle. Even then he's less, even he's less than hundred percent. Robert Scott at less than hundred percent. Isn't going to be able to cleanly block miles Murphy every play. I mean that, that fumble he forced where he just got a clean rush off the edge, off the blind side. Jordan didn't really see it was coming until it was too late to try to protect the ball. I mean, he, he tried to protect the ball. Miles Murphy just got a clean hand on it and knocked it out. That when that happens, there's not much you can do, even if you're securing the ball pretty well. And so, yeah, I think that, I mean, you're, that, that defensive line remains ferocious. Brian Breesey was back. Xavier Thomas was back. Miles Murphy, KJ Henry, Tyler Davis. I mean, that is a list of dudes. And obviously, I mean, who knows? You wonder if Fabian Love would have been able to make it back. And I know he made a late charge. I think he, he practiced Friday, it sounded like. And I know he's been practicing this week. It seems like he'll be back soon and would it have been great to get him back in that game yes could he have changed the result possibly but at the same time it almost feels like more important to have him especially if he would have been pretty far from 100 for this for this home stretch more it, it is uh, uh yeah it's a uh, it was uh, and that it's funny until the uh the comeback happened i mean that was gonna be the story i was gonna write it was kind of like uh it was a sobering reminder of of how far you have left to go. Cause this was definitely a litmus test game against, against Clemson. And uh, yeah, they, they, I don't know. I mean, they, they, it, it's hard not to be at least a little encouraged, but like I said, simultaneously, there is like the, Oh wow. Like they're probably going to keep recruiting like that. We'll see. I mean, it'll be interesting to see. That's the thing with Clemson moving forward is not just can the new coordinators keep going, but they can, can they keep up the recruiting momentum that, uh, that Venables and Tony Elliott had going there? I mean, we're, I, 
Like I, we're trending in the right direction. Yeah. We didn't win. And, you know, all fans, you know, the fan base wants to win and, you know, all that, but it, it doesn't come, like I said, right. You know, from one year, we're going to win all the games next year, but like the things to look at uh, FSU in 2021 against Clemson, we had 12 first downs compared to 28 first downs this game, four for 13 on third down in 2021. And we were seven for 13. We had 176 passing yards in 2021. And last or Saturday, we had 254. And so we had 65 rush yards in 2021. And we had 206 this Saturday. Like those are the things you got to look at where it's like, we, we've improved. Like we're going, we're heading in the right direction. And that was a banged up line. I think last year too, that Clemson defensive line last year was banged up. I think there were yeah. you guys either returning or who were definitely less than hundred percent and you still couldn't run against them. And you, yeah. you could this year. I mean, it's a, uh, it, it, it is a bit unfortunate maybe that you didn't get Clemson last year when they were down. I mean, you led that game in the fourth quarter and then, kind of the uh, unfortunate uh, backdoor club cover on the, uh, the, the hook and ladder play, but yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think the, the, the noteworthy thing is that it's clear in today's day and age. I mean, things can change quickly. Transfer portal can accelerate some things. It hasn't maybe to the level some Florida state fans would have, would have hoped or wanted, but I think it, it bears mentioning. I mean, it, it, it will, will, it, this is an interesting time in, in both programs trajectories. I couldn't agree more with, with both of you. And I think this program has done a lot to improve its roster overall. I think the transfer portal this off season did a lot to help this program overall. And Mike Norvell and his staff deserve credit for some of the key names they went and got. That being said, three of those names right off the bat, haven't played for you this season, really. I mean, Bless Harris played a little bit, got hurt, done for the year. Uh, Caden Lyles, that's two guys on the offensive line that I think you kind of needed to to be able to to compete at the level that I think FSU fans are hoping this program can compete. Winston Wright, fingers crossed, you know, that he comes back at any point this season, but it's not a guarantee that he's even going to be a shell of himself from what he was at West Virginia. Losing Fabian Lovett is too big. And the point I'm trying to make, uh, even Ja'Kai Douglas, who just came back, right? There are so many names that have been out or have been injured at some point this year where I don't believe Florida State has built the depth, the quality depth behind it to be able to sustain the type of season that they want, which is a credit to the way they're playing despite some of these injuries and uh, people are ripping Turnitine a lot right now for, for his play. But I think the kids giving you what he can um, based on what he was expected to do for you coming in. So um, this program has sustained a lot of injuries and I've had texts from people that say, you know, miss me with that. Everybody has injuries. Yeah, they do. But two things, one, other people's injuries haven't been as catastrophic as some of the ones FSU's had Two. Not every, you know, some programs are built to sustain those types of injuries just a little bit better than FSU. So four and three after seven games, considering what has happened. I mean, you won a game at Louisville with Tate Rodemaker at quarterback. So like these guys have given you their hearts and their souls, I think, and, and they've given you a pretty good effort so far. Yeah. yeah. Extension, of what you, yeah extension of what you said too, Ari. I'll let you go, Roberto. Sorry. Yeah. We'll talk about it. This upcoming stretch is going to be bigger, I think, than these last three games from a standpoint of, I mean, we'll see how strong you finish. You can't live in the portal forever. And I think a strong finish, be it four and one or be it five and oh, not that I think that's likely, but it's possible. I mean, that will be big for high school recruiting because that's going to be the, the, where you have the long-term success and where you can maybe come closer to leveling the play fe- playing field against the Clemsons of the world. Yeah, I mean, it's showing like five star wide receiver, uh, 2023 uh, five star receiver commit saying, you know, he tweeted this out. I love this team. It's not about the loss. It's about the fight. There's a difference when you lose and give up and lose with heart. As long as I'm going to war with a team that's going to fight, that's all that matters. So you so recruits are seeing this, you know, it's it's showing. And and I, I mean, we can we can go like I'm going to I'm going to get like very like analytical and very like like uh, Malcolm Gladwell, like the outsiders type deal where it's like, imagine if with the injuries, like speaking about the injuries, imagine if we didn't have this like three game stretch of NC state, Wake Forest, Clemson, like it was spread out, right? Maybe we had an NC state and then another, like a Georgia tech. And then 
you know, maybe a Wake Forest, and then Clemson was like later in the year. Like w- that would have given enough time of the, for the guys like Fabian Lovett to heal and like a couple other guys to heal. And it maybe would have been, you know, a different, a, a different turnout. Like we would have been, you know, highly or mid rank, maybe like heading into one of those games. Like, you know, uh, we, if we lose a, you know, NC state and then we win a couple and then, you know, you don't know how the, the team momentum is going to be heading into that Wake Forest game. We, we beat Wake Forest. And then we have a couple other teams and then we, we play, you know what I mean? Like it could have gone a a lot differently depending on how the schedule was made, but having that tough three game stretch um, after four games, it's, it's, it wasn't in our favor. And, you know, we come to see it, we fought, but it could have been a lot different. Um, So that's another thing to consider uh, with the injuries and how this, schedule uh you know was 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 you know made for us like we, you know we had all those those three those three teams that, that were really good but hey you know sometimes you need like a little bit of like luck of the draw where like you know the bye weeks in the right times uh, uh you know games spread out or maybe like heavy in the last part of the season you never know it could have gone a different way absolutely that's 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 spot on and you know what they're telling those recruits too roberto right now they're telling them the guys like Hakeem Williams, you know, we can only provide the culture. We can provide this fight. We can provide opportunities. If you were on the field, the results probably a little bit different. Right. And those are the things they tell recruits. You remember that through your recruiting process. Oh, yeah, they would yeah, tell yeah. you, you know, they're not going to say this publicly, but yeah. privately it's, Hey man, like if you're in there, you're a different cat, different result, you know? So that's why these top tier recruits are looking for things like fight, you know, and, and they're looking for NIL, but that's a story for a different day, but they are right. Like these recruits are definitely looking at more intangibility things because they know in the back of their brains, I'm probably better than the guy that they've got out there right now. Oh yeah. And, and if I'm a recruit, like I'm looking at this where it's like, you know, I'm not going to get mad if, if I'm a wide receiver and, and like I'm a four star or a five star and a, and a five star receiver commits, or like, there's a couple, like a lot of them are like, vice versa. Like you're a five-star wide receiver and then you got a five-star DB like DB coming on, or even though at this, at your same position, it's like, dude, those guys are going to make you better. Like you're going to like, iron's going to be sharpening iron. Like, like, do you want to go to a school where you're the only top five recruit and you know, how are you going to get better? And like, you, there's going to be depth. Like when you're out, you know, like maybe you take a couple plays off, but you know, the guy going in is, is, is going to be just as good as you. Like, that's what we've been talking about depth. Like we need depth at that position. Like we had so many good guys, like during my era where, you know, if one guy came out, like another guy was going to be just as good going in and and that's what you need. And at the end of the day, you're all going to get better. You're going to attract NFL teams to practice. Like eventually the goal is to make it to the league. So if you have coaches, you know, uh, 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 at your practice, uh, because they're looking at a, a Jalen Ramsey or, or Jameis Winston, but you're just a five star there too. You know they might be looking at them, but then you make a play in practice, and they're like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa. who's that guy right there?" You know what I mean? Like you want all these you know top four or five star recruits coming in because all you are just going to be better and make each other better and go and and hey, what's you know? Oh, we're going to go win a national championship. Like like that's that's what you want. And I feel like sometimes these these recruits kind of get like, oh, you know oh man, that five-star committed. Like I got to go somewhere else. Cause I'm not going to play. It's like, dude, like you're going to go to a school that you're the best guy there and no team, you're not going to win championships and you're not going to get NFL recruits to come and you're not going to get better. So that, that's something like I would look at as a recruit coming in. And that's something too, Kurt, you know, when we talk about this team's record, right. And we see four and three. I think Roberto makes a good point about, you know, maybe if the schedule is spread out a little bit differently and, and what if this sure. and what if that, and that's, I think that's all fair. My point I think we should also make is that Florida state probably caught some breaks too along the way so far, right? Like the LSU and Louisville games probability would tell you, Berto, you're a big, you're a big uh, probability guy with, with gambling and, and the way, yeah. but like FSU probably didn't have a high percentage of winning both of those games, especially as they were playing out. So I do think FSU has caught some fortune in the way that some of it's gone. I, I personally believe Kurt, this team is probably closer to a five and two quality team. If you look at the analytics then they are a four and three, but the record is 
what it is. And I think it's yeah. probably pretty fair for where you're at right now. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. Like I, I I've seen now, like over the last three weeks and I understand some of it just from how the last three games played out. Like some people have like questioning, can these players, can these coaches win close games? It's like people really forget how quickly the, the LSU game ended how the Louisville game ended. It's like, it's, it, it, we, we live in a, what have you done for me lately world? And that's uh that can be challenging sometimes, but yeah, it, it, I get the frustration of, I mean, you lost three in a row. I think perspective on that's important. You lost three in a go to rank teams by a total of 18 points. You were in all three of the games. None of them were, were non-competitive losses last year, two of the three NC state was not an especially competitive game. Wake Forest was not an especially competitive game. And, and so yeah, I mean, it's I, – I I understand, especially – I mean, I look at our message board and other places and see people talking about, oh, well, like, Josh Heupel's only in year two at Tennessee and look what he's doing. Or look at what Mel Tucker was doing last year in in in, in year one at Michigan State. And, and those are both impressive seasons. But do we know what they're building long term? Or did a lot of stars just align for them? I mean, because Mel Tucker was the hot name last year, and look at what he's doing now. And and there that we see that happen a lot. So I think the case is, I mean, there is building it the right way, and there's building it the fast way. And it's not to say that Norvell's way is definitely going to work long term. I don't think we know that. But I, I think he saw the way this had to get built, and it is is doing that. And I mean, it, you can't apples to oranges. You can't you can't compare situations like that when they are not the same as they were not at these various places. I do believe deep down, by the way, guys, that the Norvell's method will work. If you get better cats in there, his method's going to work. And and that's going to be the question for Norvell: is can he bring in have success bringing in the, those dudes that that can match up and uh, of the of these three games, right? Kurt said it earlier. The NC State game is the only one really that you should have won because Vegas would have told you if Devin Leary goes out of the game in the third quarter, yeah, FSU's probably favored, right? Like that's not a NC State road favorite with Chambers at quarterback. Um, that was the one that got away because you were up in the game. Leary goes down. You really needed three points, and it didn't have to be at the end where everybody made it such a big deal, but. It could have been at any point. One drive would have ended that game, and NC State was toast, right? And, and you just never could. And they field goal, they they field goal you to death, and, and they won. Um, and that's the one that you come back and you go, FSU was better than NC State with Leary out. They should have won. Um, and I do believe if FSU and NC State played like next week, they'd win. FSU would win the game. So like that's that's what's tough. So you could be five and two. You're not five and two. You're you're four and three. And so. I love that we did talk about this. One of our first episodes, fellas, we said how important a hot start would be because I think it has at least earned some goodwill for the program to start four and oh, where the way the narrative now is after you, you lose three and oh, could you imagine if Florida state wasn't four and oh to start and you lost these three, like the world would be ending. You'd be oh, like three yeah. and four right now or something. And, and people's minds would be, you know, recruiting probably not going as well. I don't know if Hakeem Williams is in the bag, you know, verbally and, and, and publicly like that if you don't start 4-0. So kudos to them for starting hot. That was big. But the point I'm now going to, and let's transition to the rest of the season. After the bye week, you've got five very winnable games. And, and I cannot emphasize very enough. Uh, this team could run the table. Now, probability-wise, probably not likely. Yeah. But it's all there for the taking, right? And it starts with a Georgia Tech team that you get to play at home. Uh, Berto, when you look at the five teams left, Georgia Tech, uh, a Miami team that looks laughable at times right now, uh, Syracuse, who does look to be going to be a stiff test up in the Carrier sure. Dome, especially, but maybe a paper tiger. I'm not sure yet on, on yeah. what they are. And then you finish with uh, Louisiana and Florida at home. And, and Florida doesn't look very good either right now, quite frankly. So five very winnable games. Yeah. If I'm coach Norvell, I'm, I'm saying, you know, learn from what we did, you know, these first, this first half of the season, these first seven games. And yeah, it sucks. We started out four and and now, you know, we lost the last three. Oh, well, like put it behind you. Like it's in the past. We can't change it anymore. We did what we did. And to everyone, like the good that you did, good job. The mistakes that you did, let them go. Like it's done. It's over with. We can't change them. There's nothing we can do. Let's, let's make this, a five game stretch. We got a five game season right now. Like, and they're all 
winnable games. We know where we're at. We know what we can do, you know, and we know, um, you know, how to win games. We can contend. Right. So that's like a different, a different mindset from the beginning of the, of the season. Right. We didn't know if we could beat an LSU. We didn't know if we could be a little bit. We didn't know that we could contend in those last three games. Now we know we can contend. So this is almost like a, like a, uh, 2022.5, like 0.5 seat, like season now, like it's, it's, these five games, let's lock in. We have a bye week. Everyone get healthy. Everyone get their feet back under, right? All the injuries we need, go to the training room, get your treatment. Cause we're going to need everyone. Georgia tech is winnable. I and mean, like you said, they're all, they're all games that we can win yet. You know, always the rivalry games are, are it, no matter how like bad they are, like they're going to get up for those, like Miami's going to get up for that game. And you know, the we that's always, you know, a tough place to play. The fans, you know, are crazy there. And then the Florida game, right? There's no guaranteed lock. But, I mean, if at worst, I think we, you know, Syracuse, Syracuse is undefeated. I don't, I don't really know what to talk on there. I don't – I haven't seen them play. Like, I haven't seen who they've beaten. But this – I mean, you want to leave a good taste in people's – Mouths like leaving this season, and you can do this by going five and zero, and then getting us to a you know a top bowl game, a late December bowl game, and maybe you know I, I don't know a, a, a New Year's Six bowl game with how we finished, and then seeing how the rest of the teams finish. Right, some of those teams that started off hot might just fizzle out and lose a couple games, and in, in the end, and then all of a sudden you see, you know, oh Florida State is 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 nine and three, like. Whoa, you know, obviously like that's, that's at the high, but forget everything else. Five games. Let's, let's go and play ball. How, how we know we can now against, you know, good teams and, and let's see what happens. Kurt, we didn't learn a, a whole heck of a lot. Uh, I don't think from these last three games in terms of where the program is, I don't think like realistically you were like, okay, this is going to, define FSU in year three under Norvell. I do think these next five games are probably going to define what Florida state, the leap that they have taken because it's against teams that I think two rivals that, you know, we all check it off the list, right? Every year, the benchmarks, you got to beat your rivals. Uh, so that's there. And then a Clemson, uh, excuse me, a Syracuse team and a Louisiana team that come on now, like, like Georgia tech, Georgia tech just fired its coach. So uh, I really do believe FSU needs to win their final three home games and try and split one of those two on the road. Um, but this is, I think where we finally can make legitimate assumptions and, and conclusions about where Norvell has this program. Yeah. Florida state should still be Georgia tech, but it does bear mentioning they've been better since they got rid of Jeff Collins. I mean, if you're Florida state, you're almost like you couldn't hold on to him for like another, another month you had to, cause I think they're about to be, if they win tomorrow at home against Virginia, which they should, they're going to be on a three game winning streak going into that game. So I, but, but that being said, you're still going to be favored. You should still win that game. I agree. I mean, I think you can make the case looking at the macro picture of it that this five game stretch is going to define Norvell's tenure. Because I think I, even eight and four, even if they go four and one on that stretch, I think would be a successful season by most by most peoples who had realistic expectations coming into the season. There are always going to be people who say their team can win 10 wins when they didn't really have a chance at winning. 10 games who are the overly optimistic type, but most people would have taken eight and four coming into the year. Some people changed that a bit. Obviously I think the worst thing that happened for this three game losing streak was the four game winning streak. Cause people thought like people got ahead of themselves and they were like, Oh, well we should win like at least two of these three. And it's like that. No, you didn't think that preseason. Why do you think that now? Like why do, why do things change that dramatically? But yeah, I mean, this is the stretch that will define definitely the season. And when it comes to recruiting momentum, when it comes to where the fan base is with him, I mean, quite possibly Mike Norvell's tenure at FSU. Right. And, you know, I look at games like Georgia Tech and you say they've been better, but you're at home after a bye week. You've had two weeks to to really get healthy and prepare for, for a Georgia Tech team that doesn't have like incredible amounts of talent. And like you said, you should be favored. And then, you know, I do think Miami and, Cuse back to back on the road, asking for two and zero there. <laughs> it's tough. Uh, I would like to see you beat Miami um, for a lot of reasons. There is a avalanche of reasons as to why you want to win in Miami. Um, 
And then, of course, we, we've talked about the, the rest of them. I don't know about Florida up until now because it seems like every year the Florida game is a war of attrition. Who's got who left? Who's injured? Who's not? Who's healthy? And who's banged up, right, Roberto? Like, you played in that yeah. game. That's, like, rarely ever is it everyone's A squad versus A squad because it's literally game 12 of the year. Yeah, and, and obviously I don't want to put this into existence, and God forbid, but, like, you never know, like, who on our guys are going to be injured, right? You know, I, you go out there every day at practice and I know the coaches think this all the time. Like, I just hope no one gets injured at practice. You know, you hope no one gets in, injured in games, um, but it, we're playing football. Like it's going to happen. And sometimes you're going to get a lot of guys hurt. Sometimes, you know, if I'm a coach, I look, you know, I get the, uh, the head coach gets the injury report from the head trainer and he sees like, who's all injured. Like how, like how bad was the damage? And hopefully, you know, we can, and that, and that, that, those are the small thing. It goes back to the, uh, to the strength coach where, you know, they're treating them right. Right. They're, they're, they're getting their massages. They're getting their, their, their prehab, their, their treatment. Um, and it's on the, the guys to police themselves too. Like, Hey man, I have to practice. Like, let's all help in the cold tub. Like, I know like you probably like don't want to, or sometimes, but like, it's going to be for your own good because, you might have a muscle that's a, a little bit sore or, you know, that's, you don't know it, but like it might be close to pulling and those cold tubs after practice are going to keep it from getting injured on a run. And God forbid on a run, you know, Oh, my hamstrings a little tight. Boom. You're out for like two weeks. And it's like, you know, all those little things go into a championship winning team, a, a, a high caliber team. So you know, right now, if I'm a leader on the team, like I'm police, like, Hey man, like, dude, it's for our own good. Like, you know, I, I'm just like, we're all as good as our weakest link. So like, we all need to be here getting treatment on time, um, doing the right things. Like once the season's over, if you don't want to cold stuff, okay, cool, whatever. But like, let's finish out the season strong. Um, shoot, I got off track from, uh, from the question that you were going to ask, but, oh yeah. But at the end of the season, right. And, and you never know. And, and always like going into Florida, like coach Fisher would say, like, it doesn't matter like what the record is. If they're one in uh, one in uh, 11, uh, they're going to show up because it's, it's bragging rights for a whole year. Like, you don't know how much <laughs> shit, shit is talked about. Like when you like the last, you know, the rest of the year after the last year, Oh, like, Oh, well we suck, but we beat you guys. Like, you know what I mean? Like it's bragging rights. So both of us are going to come to play. Um, so it's a, it's going to be a very important last five games, last half of the season. And, and it's going to be exciting. I think Seminole fans should be excited, buy into this team, buy into Norvell for what he's doing. He showed it on paper compared to the last couple of years. The guys are buying in from a, a player perspective. I've been on a national championship winning team. I've been on a high caliber, right. You know, four seasons uh, there. And I've seen it with my own eyes. And then I, you know, I've been there when my brother was there and saw like what, what, what the team was there. And it was just like night and day. So buy in, this is what, this is what we need. We're trending in the right direction. And I'm excited to see what these last five games have in store for us. Um, and eventually, you know, a good bowl game. Norville said as much to them. I mean, he talked about it. This was the last practice of the weekend. The coaches are going recruiting, I think tonight, Wednesday night. Now they're hitting the road. And he talked about, it. he's like, if guys need to come in and get treatment, I would hope they're going to do that. But other than that, like, take a breath. He said, like, he wants guys to take a breath. If they need that, that mental break to kind of reset, take that, but be ready Sunday night for when they're back at practice. Because, I mean, I think he knows how important this stretch run is. I think you're right. I mean, obviously it is. And it's going to define the program as we've, I think, all stated. Even if FSU goes, you know, three and two in its final five games, seven and five when you were five and seven last year, I think is is maybe not the exciting step up that you were hoping for. But then that makes the bowl game, I think, even more important uh, to get that eighth win, have that positive momentum going into the offseason. If you get to eight and four, could you imagine a nine and four with a bowl win? Like that would be huge. And that was something I think, you know, uh, Florida State had in 2011, right before they started hitting their run was a nine and four season and winning a champs bowl. So the foundations can be set. This program can be defined. It should be in the next couple of uh, weeks and, and throughout the next season, I guess, Kurt, finally from you, what are two or three things you're looking forward to seeing from Florida state in this second half of the year? 
I think uh, a healthier defense. I think I, they, the defense hasn't been some huge liability. They've had their issues. They've been far from perfect, but I think they're top 25 nationally in yards per play allowed. Like, is that a perfect stat? No, but I think that speaks to, especially given the schedule they've played, that 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 they're they're good in that regard. But I think, I mean, getting Fabian Lovett back will be a big deal. I think a week for guys like Amari and Cooper, four guys like Jared Verse, four guys like Tatum Bethune, four guys like Jamie Robinson. You've had a lot of guys who I think have been playing at less than 100%. What can this, what can this week do for them? And I guess even on the other side of the ball, guys like Winston Wright, Guys like Treshawn Ward, like how close to uh, back is he? And I mean, I don't know. I'm interested to see. I think I'm interested to see if this team can finish those games. We saw some down the stretch last year. They were quite, I mean, the Miami game, they finished. The Boston College game, they finished. The Florida game, they they almost came back and won after really having a stretch, almost like this Clemson game where they they blew it. I think they're going to be right there. I think the, they can kind of debunk the notion over the next five games of that people are perpetuating lately over like of like that they can't finish or that they're struggling to finish. They can debunk that. If and, and I think it will be more about it wasn't they couldn't finish, is that they were playing the best teams on their schedule in quick succession. So can they do that? And I think health, improved health coming out of the bye week could help that. Roberto, what about you? Give me two or three things that you want to see either on the field. I know you've spoke a lot on the intangibles. But, but things on the field that you want to see for the second half of the year? Um, to me, it's, it's, it's limiting, limiting turnovers as much as possible. I think that's the biggest harp that, that, that I got or that I, like, in the NFL that, that, that affected games in a big way. Um, if you have more than one, if you have more than one turnover, let's, the, like, the probability of you winning the game like goes so down. It's crazy. Like in the NFL, like there's stat, like there's stats of like goals, like, you know, you want to achieve. And um, that was like one of the biggest ones. And if we can limit the turnover or, you know, have the turnover battle, like we win it, um, you know, on defense, like, like, you know, try to force turnovers, try to force big, big plays. Right. But also like, you know, play smart, right. You're not going to win the game in the first quarter, but you can, but you can lose it in the first quarter, right? Start out, play smart, uh, alignment, assignment, technique, right? Limit, limit the mistakes. We can contend. We're good players. We we can make plays, right? It's just don't don't, you know, uh, for Jordan Travis, don't try to force a big play in the first quarter or second quarter, right? Let the game play out. You know, rely on your guys in four quarters. We're gonna we're gonna do this. But if you set yourself up, you set yourself up with you know turnovers. And then you're coming from behind. Then that's when you got to start forcing the ball a little bit more, and you risk more turnovers. So I think just limiting the penalty, limiting uh, the mistakes, limiting penalties, uh, limiting turnovers, and if we play efficient games, like we'll win. Like that, that'll the winning will take care of itself. Uh, continue what we were doing in the running game, um, and I think I think really that that's what. You want to see where where it's like we could have won that game, but if it wasn't for that, you know, turnover or, and also finishing scoring in the reds in the red zone. Like once we cross that twenty five, like we should be guaranteed three points, right? And when I go back to saying you know the turnover battle, like the biggest thing Coach Fisher would harp on, and I said it before, like every possession ends in, and then the team would say that we would say kick, right? Either a punt. A field goal, that's what it's ending in. We're not ending it in a turnover, a turnover on downs. Like we're we're scoring or we're punting, we're switching the field position and relying on our defense um to to hold them and to stop them. Um so I think I think we need we we need to do that these last couple of games. Ryan's been fine, he made his two extra points, like he's 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 good, you know. So I think if we can do that, I think we're gonna we have a good chance of 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 finishing out the season uh, strong. Yeah, I like your points, guys. Uh, I think, you know, for me, my, my couple of things are just get healthy. Um, let's see the defense create some turnovers as well. I really like to see this defense be able to really help the offense out with some better field position at times. And it's an explosive offense, in my opinion. We've seen that throughout the year. I'd like I'd like to see the defense and offense play in sync um, at, at times if they can in the second half. So back to the drawing board there for, for Fuller's unit. And then... I think I'd like to see this team start running the football more. I, I think we're getting away from dictating tempo. And I, I understand the last three games, 
two of them you've been playing from behind. So, so the passing numbers have to go up, but like 42 attempts for Jordan Travis in a football game, 30, even 35 is just, it's too much. I, I think Jordan's improved a ton. I think I've credited him for, for becoming the quarterback that he has. This team needs to run the football. And that's just, it's a good, you got three good running backs. We'll see, I guess, what Ward's status is going forward, but you've got some good backs and your identities running the football. Let's get back to that because I, I do believe this team um, can do some damage. And, and I think they can manage games a little bit better too, in terms of finding ways to be in control and command of games as it goes on. The way against LSU, they did, that they were in command for large parts of that game, which is why I think they held on and won. So, uh, yeah. All right, boys. Well, I think this has been a, a really good episode. Uh, good stuff from both of you. And uh, we'll reconvene as Florida State takes on Georgia Tech next week. Enjoy your bye week. I uh, hope you guys get out. Enjoy the weather that's cooling off a little bit here in Florida. And, um, yeah, uh, good stuff from you. Roberto, awesome. Kurt, great stuff. We're on Spotify. We're on Apple. We're on YouTube. We appreciate you guys listening. And, each and uh, every week. So for Roberto Aguayo and Kurt Weiler, I'm Mario Masudi, and you've been listening to First and Null.